Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what an incredible chapter, or at least half a chapter, we just read together. Actually, in my preparation, I read, read the whole thing, and I will touch on some things that, that happened afterwards. I think it's worth remembering as we do this. Who wrote this book that we're reading from? It was written by Dr. Luke. Um, and I think it's important to remember, as we consider something here quite so miraculous, that Luke's purpose in writing both the Gospel of Luke and this was to set out accurately and factually what had happened. So that the person he was writing to, a guy called Theophilus, who we don't really know very much about, but he was writing to Theophilus, and he says to Theophilus in Luke, look, I want you to understand that these things really happened, and I want you to get a hold of what is going on here, because it's important that you do. And I often think, you know, that this, these books are a bit like CSI Jerusalem, you know, they're a bit like investigating all the facts and coming up with the information. And I think that Luke, as a man of science, was saying, look, you can rely on what I'm telling you here. This is not some fairy tale. It's not myths. I've examined the evidence very carefully, and I'm convinced that something quite remarkable was happening here. So I think it's fair to say, as we sort of open up this chapter 12, that it's important that we understand that this is real, this is a real story, this really happened, um, and we're examining it from a factual perspective to try to understand what God is saying to us as it's presented to us here today. We as believers believe that as Luke wrote this, he was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so that as we read it today, 2,000 years later, we can get stuff from it that we can use in our daily living today. The chapter opens with, well, James is dead. He's been beheaded. Peter is in prison. The church is in turmoil. Herod is triumphant. And really, for the church, everything looks incredibly bleak. And yet, by the time you get to the end of chapter 12, Herod the king is dead. Peter is free from prison, and the glorious news about Jesus is spreading around the city and around the world again. If I was going to sum up what is happening here, I would do it with the phrase, in and through every circumstances, however bleak, God's word triumphs. And I think that's something that we need to get hold of today. It's real. It's something that actually should put a smile on our faces. It's something that should make us rejoice. In and through all circumstances, however bleak, God's word triumphs. You see, God's agenda for the world is that the news of Jesus being king, that Jesus is going to have a kingly rule over the world, should spread. I'm seeing the odd smile. But actually, do you know what? That is what we're talking about this morning. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what it is that you might be battling with or facing. But remember, in and through all circumstances, however bleak, God's word triumphs. I wonder if I may, just for a few minutes, to look at the structure of the book of Acts. Not, not in great detail, but... I think that by doing that, it will help us to better understand what Luke is doing in this chapter. The purpose of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of Jesus Christ, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, however you want to think about it, overall is to explain how a little Jewish sect that started in Jerusalem came to be a worldwide phenomena with believers from every nation. I don't know if you ever realised that before, but Christianity as we know it today started as a little Jewish sect in Jerusalem. All of the original believers were Jews, and there weren't many of them. And they were opposed, and they were told they'd got it wrong. And they were told that they were moving away from the true religion, and they needed to come back, and they were treated very badly. 
But in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 8, Luke tells us that Jesus told his disciples, his apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's quite a remarkable claim when what you've got is a small group of people opposed, rejected. But, says Jesus, something is going to happen to you that is so powerful, so amazing, that this news about me, my birth, my death, my resurrection, is going to spread all over the world. We need the book of Acts in our Bibles to make the link between the Gospels and the Epistles, the letters. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then we go into Romans, Corinthians, and so on. And we need Acts in the middle to act as a link, because if we didn't have this book without it, there would be a huge number of unanswered questions in the letters that were written by believers, mostly Paul, but not entirely Paul, we wouldn't really be able to understand them very well. And the book of Acts is split into two sections. The first part is in chapters 1 to 12, and that's the mission of Peter, under Peter's guidance, centred in Jerusalem to take this message out. And then from chapter 13... Luke sets out the mission to the Gentiles all the way to Rome under the leadership of Paul. So you've got the first 12 chapters, is Peter leading the church, and it's about building the Jewish community to be believers. And then in chapter 13, Paul takes over and takes the, church, the, the word to the rest of the world, the non-Jews, the Gentiles as we call them. And in this first part that you're just coming to the end of now at chapter 12, there are some key verses that remind us what is happening here in connection with that big picture. That the news about Jesus is spreading like wildfire beyond every boundary. And the first of those, I'm guessing that you've gone through these, you'll find in chapter 6 verse 7 where Luke tells his readers, So the word of God spread. The numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And then again in chapter 9 verse 31 he makes a similar point. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, the church increased in numbers. And you can see that theme, you can see that the theme throughout everything that Luke is writing, and he keeps repeating it, is the growth of the church. And actually, if we'd gone to the end of chapter 12 in verse 24, you'd have heard these words. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So can you understand the, the point about Luke's gospel here and the structure of it? God's agenda is that the, the news of the kingly rule of Jesus Christ is going to keep advancing. And Luke says to Theophilus, I want you to understand this. It might seem remarkable, but every time something happened that looked like it was going to be the end of the church, it was actually growing and developing and spreading. I don't know about you, but having read the first 12 chapters of Acts, there's a question that I feel I have to ask. You see, if the first 12 chapters are about Peter spreading the gospel to the Jews, and the next ones from 13 onwards are about Paul taking it to the Gentiles, I'm scratching my head a little bit because Luke tells us about the conversion of Paul and the call of him to go and take the gospel to the Gentiles in chapter 9. So having said what I just said, wouldn't it make sense for any writer to say, okay, I'm introducing a new character in chapter 9. Everything that's gone before now doesn't matter anymore because this guy's going to take it to the rest of the world. 
So why have we got chapters 10, 11 and 12? It seems to me that you could take them out. You don't need them. It could have laid down the foundation of the tr foundational truths and just walked straight into the story of Paul and how he took it forward. So that begs the question, what's going on here in 10, 11 and 12? Luke is writing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So why is he telling us these stories? Why is he telling us what happened here in chapter 12? Well, I think what, Paul, what Luke wants us to grasp here, what the Holy Spirit wants us to understand, is not just that the gospel goes out, but he wants us to understand how the gospel goes out. And actually, if you read chapters 10 and 11, you'll find that there are prototypes in there. The first believers, the first churches. They show us how the gospel is growing and developing. And we can learn lessons from those prototypes. And then in verse 12, we see it in chapter 12, we see an example of what it will look like as the gospel advances. And it seems to me that if we miss out chapter 12, then we miss out a key feature that it's important that we understand. And the key feature is this. I think Luke wants us to have confidence that the gospel is something we can rely on and that it is God's agenda that is taking it forward. We don't have to rely on our own strength. Luke says, look, I want you to understand that what I'm talking about here, this remarkable spread of the gospel, is not happening because of men. It's happening because it's God's agenda. And I want you to have confidence in that. And I think that God wants you, the people of Swanwick, <laughs> me, to have confidence that we can put our trust completely in the gospel, that we can share it with other people, because however bleak it looks, it's God's agenda. It's God's plan. You are a light shining in this place because God is going to share the gospel, and you can be confident in that. And I think the story is, the story that we've read together, the story of Peter's Escape, is that the right word? Release from prison is absolutely key to that, and we have to understand it. If we don't grab this story, then we won't have confidence. We'll be lacking in confidence. But when you read this story, these events, it builds our confidence. You see, the key truth is that God is sovereign in all circumstances and that He is going to advance the kingdom. Look, the truth is the gospel will always be opposed as it's advanced. Let's get that clear in our heads. The world doesn't want to hear this message. It will always be opposed as, as it advances. But God is sovereign and it will advance. You cannot snuff out the church. You cannot snuff out the people of God. It doesn't matter what you do. God is in control. Just look at the opposition that the church was facing here in Luke chapter 12. Herod Agrippa was part of a violent line. His uncle was Herod Antipas. He's the one who made that drunken promise to Salome and consequently ordered the beheading of John the Baptist. And he was the one who tried Jesus and handed him over to be crucified. His grandfather not only slaughtered the innocents at the birth of Jesus, but he murdered his, two, his wife and his two sons, one of whom was this Herod's father, and he arranged for a hundred Jewish leaders to be slaughtered at the time of his death so that there would be enough mourning going on in the city when he died. This guy was insecure. This guy knew only one way of dealing with things, and that was violence. And you know what? He didn't like minorities either. 
So what he was trying to do here, you'll see this in the passage that we've read together, was he was trying to ingratiate himself with the Jews and especially the religious leaders by persecuting these Jewish Christians. If I persecute these Jewish Christians and make their life really difficult, then all the Jewish religious leaders will love me. There's a message there about what happens in society, you know. Very often the established religion will gang up on the minorities. Very often people will use religious leaders. Governments will, co will, will work with religious leaders to bash down the truth. And that sort of hostility continues. You'll see it as you carry on reading through the rest of the book of Acts. And do you know what I think Acts chapter 12 is there for? It's there to tell us this is normal. This is normal. There will always be opposition to the gospel. We've probably all experienced a bit of opposition, haven't we? Called friendships. People who perhaps are not so comfortable in our presence anymore since we come to know Jesus. Family members distanced. Relationships that aren't quite the same as, as they were. And if you look around the world, you'll see violent opposition to Christians. Did you know that in September, 49 Christians were killed and 27 were kidnapped in Nigeria? An international NGO found that there was a 60% increase globally of Christians being killed for faith-related reasons in 2020, up from 2019. But I'm going to say it again. This may be normal. But you can't destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Luke's focus in this chapter is on the release of Peter. It's on the death of Herod. And it's on the rise of the gospel. So at the beginning of the chapter, the, the cause seems hopeless and the church seems helpless. The founding apostles, James, Peter, they're all out of action. And Peter is about to be killed. Did you hear the security measures that were in place on Peter? Herod had him arrested and taken by 16 guards. 16 guards to guard one man. Wow. And when he was sleeping, he was bound in chains. He had two soldiers by his side and two at the door. And I want you to understand that these soldiers, these guards, they knew Herod's reputation. They knew what would happen if Peter got out. And actually, if you'd read on in the chapter, it's exactly what did happen. Herod had them killed. I'll tell you what, these guards were terrified that Peter would get away. That's why they guarded him so tightly. That's why he was bound up so well. The situation is hopeless, helpless, hopeless, and the people of God seem helpless. They can't do anything. But wherever the gospel is to be advanced, God will ensure progress. You see, Luke emphasizes not only the immense security that was around Peter, but he emphasizes the miraculous release. Peter is sound asleep. So much so that the angel has to really prod him to wake him up. Come on, Peter, we're getting out of here. He's in chains and he needs to be freed. He's stripped and he needs to be clothed. He's in dark surroundings. He needs to be led. He's under guard and he needs to be protected. And the huge doors need to be opened for him to get out. I'll tell you what, David Blaine couldn't have pulled off this, this escape. Not a chance. Only God could have pulled this off. And I want to emphasize what I said at the beginning again. It's a real angel that came to release him. In fact, this is so miraculous that Peter thinks it's a dream. It's a vision. He doesn't think it's really happening. He hasn't woken up at all. He thinks he's dreaming it. 
It's only later in verse 11 when the angel disappears that he says, wow, this really happened. I'm free and this angel has got me out of prison. Luke wants us to be clear that God in his sovereignty is in complete control of all circumstances for the advance of the gospel. He protects his people and overthrows those who stand in its way. We can be assured that the advance of the gospel is certain. And if we as his people are to be involved in that, then we need to understand that entrenched opposition is normal. And here I think is the key element and why really I brought prayer to the youngsters when we, when we did the kids slot earlier. Because I think that prayer is key to this incident. Our prayers are used by God in his sovereignty for the advance of the gospel. Did you notice that in, cha- in verse 5? That the church feeling helpless, its knee-jerk reaction was to pray. And Luke uses the same word here in this chapter that he used of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. This was earnest prayer. This was serious prayer. They know that prayer is the only weapon that they have. There is nothing that they can do themselves. They're helpless. They need to pray and they're praying earnestly from their hearts, desperately calling on God to do something amazing. The opposition holds all the cards. Only a miracle of God can change things. I don't know about you, but I love that moment when Peter comes to the door. You can almost, it's, it's comedic, isn't it? It's almost, like, it's almost like a pantomime. Rhoda says, oh, it's Peter, leaves the door shut. <laughs> Doesn't invite him in. Leaves the door shut, goes rushing into the others and says, Peter's at the door. And they say, don't be ridiculous. Oh, no, he's not. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> it's like a pantomime. It's comedic. But what I think is interesting here is that, well, they obviously weren't entirely sure about the answer to their prayer, were they? They knew what they were praying for, but somehow, well, that can't happen, can it? So when it does, it's like, no, 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 you must be mistaken. Look, I know that's what we're praying for, but come on, get real. That's not going to happen. You've seen the security measures. There's no way he's going to get out. That's not possible. I don't know about you, but sometimes my prayer's a bit like that. I pray in faith, but actually, do you know what? It's not really going to happen, is it? It's too much to ask. But with God, all things are possible. And in this instance, God uses their prayers and answers their prayers. And here's the lesson for us today, I think. There will be bleak times. There will be times when things seem beyond hope. But don't be in any doubt that God is in control. It's normal for there to be opposition to the Christian gospel. It's normal for us to think this can't go anywhere. But God uses your prayers and mine. Anybody here remember Frank Witcher? I had the privilege of leading Frank Witcher. I think he was in his 80s when I led him. He came to me at the front. I'd been preaching. He came to me and said... Can I pray with you? And I went upstairs. We went upstairs and we prayed together. And he opened his heart to the Lord. And he said to me, do you know what, Steve? He said, my mum's been praying for me for 50 years. 50 years. I bet she thought this is never going to happen. But it did. And he became a mighty warrior for God in his 80s. We need to learn to pray faithfully, trusting in the Lord. Because the sovereign advance of the gospel is in his hands. But I want you to notice something else. And I think this is very pertinent to you guys here this morning. I haven't said much about James. That's because he doesn't feature much in this passage. It's just mentioned at the beginning. Because he's dead. And you think, well, surely James was key to the advance of the gospel. Well, in human terms, you might have decided that, but God is sovereign, and God had decided that James's work was complete. 
James had done all that he needed to do and the time had come for him to go home. Listen, one thing we must learn to understand is that we have to trust God in every circumstance, even when we don't understand it, whether it's rescue or not. I want to close with a verse found in Psalm 116, verse 15. The psalmist says this, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Here's what, had, here's what Spurgeon said about that verse. God's people shall not die prematurely. They shall be immortal until the work is done and when their time comes to die. Then their death shall be precious. The Lord watches over their dying beds. He smooths their pillows. He sustains their hearts and he receives their souls. You know what? We may think that Alan hadn't finished his work, but as far as God was concerned, he had. And listen, God has given you and me a work to do. And until that work is complete, I'll tell you something, we're immortal. We won't die until God has decided we have completed that work. And when we die, he will receive us into his arms and say, that's it, you're done. You've finished what I needed you to do. Come and rest in me. Not one hair of our head falls to the ground until the time has come for us to be received by him in his glorious heaven. So here's how we finish. With absolute confidence, we can get on with the work of spreading the gospel. Yes, there will be hostile resistance, but the gospel will advance, and in some cases, there will be glorious rescue. But until that time, we are protected, and we can boldly and prayerfully share the gospel. Because it's God's agenda. It's God's sovereign plan. May God bless you, help you, and encourage you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing once more. Great song to close with. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And opened the life gate that all may go in and we sing from our hearts, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's number 708, Colin, 708.